the woolly gray backs of its flocking houses, which are fragrant, fragrant, a fragment of its medieval ramparts enclosed here and there in an outline as scrupulously circular as that of a little town in a primitive painting. To live in, Cambrai was a trifle depressing, like its streets whose houses, built of the blackened stone of the country, fronted with outside steps, capped with gables that projected long shadows downward, were so dark that one had, as soon as the sun began to go down, to draw back the curtains in the sitting room window streets with the solemn names of saints from the windows. Streets with the solemn names of saints, not a few of whom figured in the history of the early lords of Cambrai. The Rue Saint-Hilaire, the Rue Saint-Jacques, in which my aunt's house stood, the Rue Saint-Hilgard, which ran past her fence, and the Rue de Saint-Esprit, unto which the little garden gate opened. And these Cambrai streets exist in so remote a part of my memory, painted in colors so different from those that now adorn the world for me, that all of them, and the church that towered above them in the square, seem to me now more unsubstantial than the projections of my magic lantern. And at times I feel that to be able to cross the Rue de Saint-Hilaire again, to engage a room in the Rue de l'Oiseau, in the old hostelry of the Oiseau Flaché, from whose basement windows rose a smell of cooking which rises still in my mind, now and then, just as intermittent and warm, would be to secure a contact with the beyond, more marvelously supernatural than it would be to make Golo's acquaintance and to chat with Genevieve, Genevieve de Brabant. My grandfather's cousin, my great aunt, with whom we used to say, with the mother of Aunt Wada, Leonie, who, since her husband's, my uncle Octave, Octave's death, had gradually declined to leave, first Cambrai, then her house in Cambrai, then her bedroom, and finally her bed, and who now never came down, but lay perpetually in an indefinite condition of grief, physical exhaustion, illness, obsessions, and religious observances. Her own room looked out over the Rue Saint-Jacques, which ran a long way farther to the end, to the Grand Pré, as distant, as distinct from the Petit Pré, a green space in the center of town where three streets met, and which, monotonous and gray, with the three high steps of stone before which, before almost every one of its doors, seemed like a deep furrow cut by some sculpture of Gothic images in the very block of stone out of which he had fashioned a crèche or a cavalry. My aunt's life was now practically confined to two adjoining rooms, in one of which she would rest in the afternoon while they, while they aired the other. There were rooms of that country order which, just as in certain climes whose tracts of air or ocean are illuminated or scented by myriads of protozoa that we cannot see, fascinate our sense of smell with the countless odors springing from their own special virtues, wisdom, habits, and whole secret system of life, invisible, superabundant, and profoundly, profoundly moral, which their atmosphere holds suspended. Smells natural enough, indeed, and colored by circumstances, as are those of the neighboring countryside, but already domesticated, humanized, confined, an exquisite, skillful, limpid jelly, blending all the fruits of the season that have left the orchard for the storeroom, smells changing with the year, but replenishing domestic smells, which compensate for the sharpness of the hoar frost with the sweet savor of warm bread, smells lazy and punctual as a village clock, roving smells, steadfast smells, heedless and provident Linen smells, mourning smells, pious smells, rejoicing in a peace that brings only an increase of anxiety and a prosiness that serves as a deep source of poetry to the stranger who passes through their midst without having lived among them. The air of those rooms was saturated with a fine bouquet of a silence so nourishing, so succulent, that I could not enter them without a sort of greedy enjoyment particularly on those first mornings, chilly still, of the Easter holidays, when I could taste it more fully, 
because I had just arrived there at Cambrai. Before I went in to wish my aunt good day, I would be kept waiting a little time in the outer room where the sun, a wintry sun still, had crept in to warm itself before the fire, lighted already between its two brick sides and plastering the room and everything in it with the smell of soot, making the room like one of those great open hearths that one finds in the country or one of the canopied mantelpieces in old castles under which one sits, hoping that outside it is raining or snowing, hoping even for a catastrophic deluge to add the romance of shelter and security to the comfort of a snug retreat. I would take a few steps from the prie dieu to the stamped velvet armchairs, which one always draped in a crocheted anti-mascar, anti while the fire, baking like a pie, that like a pie, the appetizing smells with which the air of the room was thickly clotted, which the dewy and sunny freshness, freshness of the morning had already raised and started to set, puffed them and glazed them and fluted them and smelled them into an invisible and palpable country cake, an immense puff of pastry, in which barely waiting to savor the crustier, more delicate, more respectable, but also drier smells of the cupboard the chest of drawers, and the patterned wallpaper, I always returned with an unconfessed gluttony to bury myself in the ordinary, ruinous, resinous, dull, indigestible, and fruity smell of the flowered quilt. In the next room, I could hear my aunt talking quietly to herself. She never spoke, save in low tones, because she believed that there was something broken in her head and floating loose there, which she might displace by talking too loud. But she never remained, remained for long, even when alone, without saying something, because she believed it was good for her throat, and that by keeping the blood there in circulation, it would make less frequent the chokings and other pains from which she suffered. Besides, in the life of complete inertia that she had led, that she led, she attached to the least of her sensations an extraordinary importance, endowed them with a motility that made it difficult for her to keep them secret. And failing a confidant, confidant to whom she might communicate them, she used to announce them to herself in an unceasing monologue which, her whole, which was her sole form of activity. Unfortunately, having formed the habit of thinking aloud, she did not always take care to see that there was no one in the adjoining room. And I would often hear her saying to herself, I must not forget that I never slept a wink, for never sleeping a wink for never sleeping a wink, was her great claim to distinction, and she admitted and respected in our household vocabulary. In the morning, Françoise would come to wake her, but would simply enter her room during the day. When my aunt wished to take a nap, she used to say just that she wished to reflect or rest. And when in conversation, she so far forgot herself as to say, what woke me up, or I dreamed that, she would bless and at once correct herself. After waiting a minute, I would go in and kiss her. Francoise would be making her tea, or if my aunt was feeling agitated, she would ask instead for her tisane, and it would be my duty to shake out of the pharmacist's little package onto a plate the amount of lime blossom required for infusion in boiling water. The drying of the stems had twisted them into a fantastic trellis in whose interlacing the pale flowers opened, as though a painter had arranged them there, grouping them in the most decorative poses. The leaves, having lost or altered their appearance, assumed those instead of the most incongruous things, the transparent wings of flies, or the blank sides of labels, or the petals of roses, but which would have been collected and pounded, or interwoven as birds weave the material for their nests a thousand trifling little details. The charming prodigality of the pharmacist, details would have been eliminated from an artificial preparation, gave me like a book in which one is astonished to read the name of a person whom one knows, the pleasure of finding that these were indeed the stems of real lime blossoms, like those I had seen in the Avenue de la Gare, altered precisely because they were not imitations, but the very same blossoms that had grown old. And as each new character is merely a metamorphosis from an older character, 
In these little gray balls, I recognize green buds plucked before their time. But beyond else, the rosy, lunar, and tender glow that lit up the blossoms in the frail forest of stems from which they hung like little golden roses, marking as the radiance on an old wall still marks the place of a vanished fresco, the detail between those parts, the distance, the difference between those parts of the tree that had and those that had not been in bloom, showed me that these were petals which, before their flowering time, the pharmacist's package have embalmed on warm evenings of spring. Those rosy, that rosy candlelight was still their color, but half extinguished and somnolent in the diminished light that was now theirs, that is like the twilight of a flower. Presently, my aunt was able to dip in the boiling infusion in which she would savor the taste of dead or faded blossoms, a little madeleine, of which she would hold out a piece to me when it was sufficiently soft. At one side of her bed stood a big yellow chest of drawers of lemon wood and a table that served at once as pharmacy and as high altar on which, beneath the statue of Our Lady and a bottle of Vichy et Celestin, might be found her missiles and her medical prescriptions, everything that she needed for the performance <coughs> in bed, of her duties to soul and body, to keep the proper times for pepsin and for vespers. On the other side, her bed was bounded by the window. She had the street beneath her eyes and would read in it from morning light to night to divert the tedium of her life like a Persian prince, the daily but immemorial chronicles of Cambrai, which she would discuss in detail afterwards with Francoise. I would not have been five minutes with my aunt before she would send me away for fear I might make her tired. She would hold out for me to kiss her sad brow, pale and lifeless, on which at this early hour she would not yet have arranged the false hair and through which the bones shone like the points of a crown of thorns or the beads of a rosary. And she would say to me, now my poor child, you must leave, you must leave me. Go and get ready for mass. And if you see Francoise downstairs, tell her not to stay too long amusing herself with you. She must come up soon to see if I want anything. 